we'll be talking a little bit about drivetrains and more of the design aspect to them. We'll be doing um, another webinar on drivetrain construction next week. So for now, we're gonna be focusing on design. Does anybody have any questions going in or should we just jump right into it? I guess we're jumping up. Uh, no, that was Natasha. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're jumping into it. Perfect. So I'll keep the chat open just in case if ever you guys have a question, you can either raise hand or just write in the chat and we'll see it. So just a quick overview of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, if ever we're going too quickly, you can just ask us to slow down a little bit or clarify anything that you're not sure about. So uh, we're going to talk about the things that you should consider before you start building your drivetrain. We're going to be talking about the types of wheels and the way to put them on your robot. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the frame, so different ways that you can kind of uh, design frames, what makes them a little bit sturdier, what can give you a little bit of an advantage, depending on what your goal is. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about motors. We're going to go into it again during construction because it kind of falls into both categories. You do need to think about motors in your design as much as you do in your construction. And we're just going to dip into programming. We're not going to go over the actual programming itself, but just more things to consider about what you should be telling the person doing the programming for your robot. And then we're just going to sort of wrap it all up at the end. Go ahead. Sounds good. OK, donc euh, une couple de choses juste à considérer avant qu'on commence. Donc, euh, le terrain, c'est vraiment un concept qu'il faut euh, prendre en tête à chaque fois qu'on commence à faire un châssis. Donc, euh, pense vraiment à quel type de surface le terrain va être. Dans notre cas, c'est sûr, ça va être même terrain que normal. Euh, c'est pas tout à fait lisse, mais c'est pas rugueux non plus. Donc, c'est juste avec la peinture euh, semi-lustrée. Donc, assure-toi de prendre ça en note euh, quant à aux roues puis tout ça. Euh, si jamais c'est bosselé, il va aussi falloir prendre en considération si ton robot est toujours en train de gigoter, est-ce que ça va avoir de l'impact sur les composants qui sont sur le robot, euh, sur euh, la durabilité du châssis et sur la puissance des moteurs. Et tu veux aussi penser à la présence d'obstacles. Donc, on va toucher un petit peu sur ça. On ne va pas vous donner toutes les réponses non plus, parce qu'effectivement, il y en a plein. Mais on, quand on pense à des pentes, des bosses, des rails, euh, des endroits plus étroits, ça, on en a moins, mais il faut quand même prendre en note euh, c'est quoi la, la grosseur du châssis, la hauteur du châssis, le type et la qualité des roues et euh, comment est-ce qu'ils vont être capables de naviguer. Euh, L'objectif de la navigation, c'est très important aussi. Il y en a certains où ce que je pense que quelqu'un a son microphone. Ouais, euh, donc euh, le but, il faut euh, il faut considérer est-ce que tu veux de la navigation qui est précis, est-ce que tu veux de la vitesse, est-ce que tu veux de la puissance. Donc euh, admettons euh, si euh, tu es dans l'armée puis tu conduis un tank, c'est sûr que la précision c'est pas exactement ton but. Tu veux plus avoir de la puissance, même pas la vitesse. Donc euh, dans ces cas-là, par contre euh, si tu es un NASCAR driver, bien sûr tu veux de la vitesse et tu veux avoir une certaine composante de précision, mais la puissance c'est pas tout à fait important parce que il y a pas beaucoup de poids qui est sur euh, les chars de NASCAR. Donc, euh, il faut penser au type de moteur qu'on va utiliser, le, con, la conception du châssis. Donc, euh, la forme va jouer un rôle dans la navigation surtout et euh, la capacité d'avoir la puissance et le choix des matériaux. Mais ça, ça va plus embarquer euh, quand on va parler de la construction plus que la conception. Et finalement, le robot elle-même, donc euh, les composants du, euh, du robot, ils vont jouer un gros rôle euh, tant qu'à à la forme du châssis. Euh, moi, je me souviens, il y avait un an où on a décidé de faire le châssis au début, puis après, on a conçu tous nos autres composants. Et euh, quand je t'ai dit que ça l'a mal viré, euh, il a tout fallu qu'on repense à nos idées, il fallait qu'on coupe un trou dans le, le bas de notre robot, c'était un petit peu l'enfer. Donc, euh, pense vraiment à ce, qu ce que tu veux mettre sur ton robot avant de concevoir ton châssis. Et comme ça, tu auras moins de limitations, tu auras moins à aller à l'extérieur de tes buts pour ce qui est des composants et de la fonctionnement du robot. Et euh, dernièrement, est-ce que ton châssis peut supporter les composants? Donc, pas seulement de niveau de la forme, mais niveau du poids, parce que des fois, il y a des composants qui sont très, très, très... Euh, très lourd. Et s'ils sont trop lourds, euh, surtout si ce n'est pas un poids distribué. Donc, si ton poids n'est pas assez distribué, il va falloir accommoder pour ça dans ton châssis. Avec tes moteurs, il va falloir penser à la, au placement des moteurs et où est-ce que tu vas avoir besoin du plus euh, de résilience, où est-ce que tu vas avoir le plus de puissance. Go ahead. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of wheels. So there's smooth fixed wheels. These are the ones that you're going to see most likely on, say, on a shopping cart or stuff like that, where they're locked in one position. They don't move. They just roll. They're cheap. They're pretty easy to adapt if you just want a static wheel. If you want them to be driven by a motor, it's pretty hard to get them to work because, as you can see in the photo, they're encapsulated. Usually they have their own mounting point built in. And they have limited traction, not only because, well, they're not driven, but because usually it's it's a cheap rubber wheel or a plastic wheel even. So they'll just kind of slide around on a lot of terrain. And that one would lead to the smooth orientable wheels or swivel or caster wheels. Again, they're cheap. They're good to be used for a two-wheel drive robot where, say, there's two motors in the rear that are being powered by motors. Uh, two wheels that are being powered by motors and the front doesn't need to be powered so you just put some caster wheels and again like a shopping cart it will just roll around and just be easy to drive again it's hard to attach a motor to this it's limited traction because it's usually made of cheap materials and it's basically impossible to be used alone because if all four of your wheels are able to turn 360 degrees your robot will just kind of slide around wherever it wants to go there's the treaded wheels and tires, which have a much better traction because it's more like a car tire where there's there's grip, there's siping on the rubber. It's not just smooth. There's no side to side movement like the fixed wheel. And you can get them in swivel as well. So if you want a little bit more traction, you can play with that. After that, we have continuous track, which is most known as a tank. So that's good on terrain and obstacles. It distributes the, rate, the weight really well because instead of just being on two points of contact, it's along the whole track along the bottom. It's a little bit harder to control like precisely because your robot is usually limited to turning on a dime instead of having any sort of a... Uh, strafing movement available to it and the mechanical tolerance Sarah would you like to expand on that point so the mechanical tolerance is more talking about when you're building it um, a lot of us tend to reuse our equipment year after year and one thing that we can sometimes notice is um, tank treads for it to have that good weight distribution and for it to work really effectively, you want the gears to not be skipping over the treads. And as the treads are used, they tend to stretch a little bit. So if they're having that little stretching, they might not fit properly into the gears, they might hitch. And so you might not have that smooth movement that you want. Um, the other thing is if ever you're taking them off, putting them back on, anytime you have to switch out a motor, if you, when you drill everything back into place, it's even a little bit off from what it was before the tread fit will not be the same as it used to be. And so it could lead to uh, not having like the, the track actually being tightened onto the gears. It'll lead to skipping and you could even have your entire, uh, depending on the material you're using and what kind of tracks you're using, but you can actually have them entirely just fall off or break open because of the tension. Yeah, and then the braking is commonly seen with the, the VEX tank treads, which are getting used less and less, but they are still pretty prominent in the competition. And there are a couple of ways to help with that. You can have tensioners or basically have your tank treads in a serpentine manner. So you can have one or two wheels on the extremities that are powered, and then say a third wheel that is just pushing down from the exterior on top to provide some sort of a tension that can help with that skipping problem. And you can also have multiple kinds of track where your wheels on the inside can be gears, but you can also have a legitimate rubber wheel inside and just have the tension on the track be what's keeping it all together. So moving on to the Omni wheels at the bottom here. And these are wheels that are very, very popular. They have great navigation because I, as you can see, it's as a whole, it's a round wheel, but it has little rollers all around it. So it can roll forward and backward like a normal wheel, but it can also be pushed side to side. It's basically like it has, it's made of wheels. They're pretty easy to use because normally they have 
shafts, well, they have holes and bearings in them to accept shafts pre-done. They're meant to be used usually for robotics competitions. They have very little resistance because it's it's a wheel made of wheels. If one wheel has no has a very little resistance, a wheel made of wheels has much less resistance. But uh, the big problem with these wheels is that there's not very good side to side traction on the terrain. So we often see if a robot say has four omni wheels and say there's a ramp or something on the train a lot of the times they'll go up the ramp and they'll start kind of just sliding sideways while they're going up so you need to keep that in mind if you're planning on using an omni wheel they need a specific frame configuration which we'll be showing later in the slide in the slides but basically usually instead of having two wheels on each side of the robot you'll have one wheel on each side making a square the downside of an omni wheel is also that they're very expensive like for example, the Vex Pro Omni wheels usually go for fifty to a hundred dollars each, depending on the size. So if you're having four to eight wheels, it adds up pretty quickly and it goes through your budget pretty quickly. And then on the top right here, we see the Mechanum wheels. These kind of take the best of the Omni wheels and the best of a regular wheel and mix them together. As you can see, they still have rollers, but they're placed at a forty-five degree angle to to the axis instead of completely against the axis. So that means that side to side, they still hold their grip pretty well, but that if you, we'll show this again later in the slides, but if you have the wheel spinning in opposite directions, it'll pull one direction or the other with the wheel. The downside to a mechanism is due to those rollers being at a 45 degree angle, your point of traction is a lot smaller and it's always on one roller at a time, maybe two if you're lucky, but if you're spinning the wheel, it'll only be on one roller at a time. So the weight distribution is pretty poor. They vibrate a lot because of this. They're pretty rough on components. So you, you see a lot of robots with mechanism wheels, they tend to jar the whole playing field. And also they tend to have a lot of bolts and nuts falling off of them just because they vibrate everywhere. So another thing to keep in mind is that you don't necessarily always have to use wheels on your robot. Um, this is a little bit of a pushed concept. So there are the wheeled robots and there's the tracked robots like we already talked about, but you can also consider maybe not for this competition necessarily, but just keep an open mind for if someone wants to go into robotics that you can also use robots that have legs. So either that little L shape that is just rolling on itself to be able to make it walk, or if it actually has a joint to be able to walk kind of like a dog. Um, they've also got legged robots that have wheels so they can roll but they can also use those legs to pick up and then go on to stairs or onto ledges uh, as needed and we also have robots with flippers i always find those ones really interesting um, they move in a very specific way that is beneficial really when you're using a certain type of terrain and otherwise you got to be careful that uh, any components on there are really locked down because they'll just go everywhere if you use flipper very robots nice. It's very aggressive. It's uh, it's really funny to watch. I recommend videos on it if ever you're feeling sad because uh, they make me laugh. So uh, yeah, and then you have the combined uh, flipper and track. So the flippers move independently from the track and it's really just when it needs that little extra boost to get up somewhere, it can use the flippers to do that. So now I'll talk a little bit about how the positioning of your wheels affect the chassis. So when you're looking at a robot chassis, as you can see in the photo, you have two measurements that you can talk about. The wheelbase, which is the center to center of the wheels front and rear, and the track width, which would be center to center of the wheels to one side to the other. So the wider that your robot is, the more stable it is when turning, so forcing weight towards the outside or on slopes. It allows also more components to fit between the wheels instead of on the outside of the robot, either on the sides or front to back. And it can be, you can place your components such as your batteries and your motors lower as well, which will lower your center of gravity and help you, especially on a ramp, to go up faster and more stable. More stable. But the wider your robot is, the wider your turns are going to be because you have a much larger turn to do with your wheel instead of just a tight turn. So on the opposite side, having a longer wheelbase means you have 
more stable front to rear, so it's less prone to flip up and down a hill. So we see that a lot with robots going up and down ramps. If they're too tall or their center of gravity is too high up, and they tend to stop either because a teammate's coming up the ramp or something similar like that. We see it happen a lot where they just kind of tip. Sometimes they tip over. Sometimes they manage to correct themselves. But being longer can help keep you stable. So what you want to do is find a good mix between width and length. Because the longer you are, the less agile you're going to be. Because turning, consider it like having to drive a bus, which is 40, 50, 60 feet long, or an 18-wheeler versus a smart car. One of them is going to be a lot easier to drive than the other. So we talk a lot about the golden ratio of a wheelbase versus track width. Usually it's one and a half, 1.4 to 1.7 on most cars. So that means that the length is about one and a half times longer than the width. So if your robot is one foot wide, your robot would be one and a half feet long. That's average. And you can see, depending on what you need, that can be adjusted. So a drag racer, a car that needs to go very fast in a very straight line, no turns, they'll be longer. So getting close to a two ratio, almost being twice as long as it is wide, versus a go-kart, which generally is a 1.0 ratio, which is basically completely square, because they need to have good acceleration, but very aggressive turns. So you want to find that, that perfect ratio for what you're doing. So I'll talk about the different drivetrain types. There's there's three main types. So you have all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive or four by four, whatever you want to call it, where all the wheels are being driven. You have front-wheel drive where it's the front wheels that are pulling the robot, and you have rear-wheel drive where the rear wheels are pushing. So all-wheel drive, four by four, four-wheel drive, whatever you want to call it, has the best traction and control, but is much heavier and more difficult to assemble and wire because instead of having two motors, generally you'll have four. You can make it work with two motors, but then you're limited to a tank. Uh, it takes the most power because, again, instead of spinning just two wheels, you're spinning four wheels or six wheels, however many wheels you are, but everything has to spin at the same time. So your motors and your whole drivetrain system is working harder to push all that extra weight. Front wheel drive, in which the front wheels, like I said, are pulling, they pull the weight of the chassis and those front wheels are gonna do the majority of the accelerating, the braking and the turning because they're at the front. So if you're stopping, everything's being pushed onto those wheels, all the momentum's being transferred to the front. This is generally much easier to drive for beginners as it's easier to drive and steer because the front is doing all the work and pulling you through. You don't really have to think about, oh, well, how much am I swinging the front end compared to a rear wheel drive? That's why a lot of cars on the road you'll see are also front wheel drive, just because it's much easier to drive. And then finally, there's rear wheel drive, which, like I mentioned, the wheels are going to be pushing the weight of the chassis. They usually have better traction than front wheel drive because, like I mentioned earlier, when braking front wheel drive, you have that momentum shift to the front wheels. A rear wheel drive, if you're accelerating with your robot, all that momentum is being shifted to the rear of the robot. So you'll get more traction as you accelerate. Whereas a front wheel drive robot, as you accelerate, if you're not balancing your wheelbase and your track width, you might pull off of the front wheels a little bit and in some cases start to spin the wheels if you have a, a powerful enough motor. So the downside to a wheel drive is that usually they have a tendency to oversteer. So the back kind of has a tendency to push out if you're at a loss for traction. So the robot will steer too much and the rear will slide out. So this is just an example of the, the three. So front wheel drive, as you can see, the, the motor or engine is in the front, all wheel drive, four by four engine in the front, and there's a way of transferring power to the rear. And finally, rear wheel drive, motors are in the front and the rear wheels are powered. 
So when you're thinking about uh, the shape of your chassis, of course, there's different ways to do it. This is just kind of uh, the different ones that are like very basic, especially uh, this is taken off of the model of like drones, uh, especially working in robotics. It's something that's good to consider about how you're going to distribute your weight. So the first thing that I would point out is that you want to think about things that would be, a, for example, good for Omni wheels, something that's in that X shape where it's a true X. That's excellent for an Omni wheel setup because it'll give you so many different different ranges of motion where you can navigate super easily with it and it distributes your weight from the middle to the outside instead of having all of it go to the edges of it if it were just a normal square. Um, if you are doing a square, however, I do recommend having some sort of links in the middle just to have it go across and not just all on the outside frame and have your wheels kind of cinch inwards or if you do put just a plank on top, have them go outwards. Um, the good weight bearing, uh, the, the one that's the hybrid X, so it's a little bit longer, as you can see, it's not exactly perfectly like even on all sides. So it has that rectangular middle and the X's are not at perfect 90 degrees. So it's really good for uh, weight bearing and the navigation ratio is a little bit more complicated, kind of like Patrick said, when you have that longer body. Um, so the main things that I kind of want to just have you guys consider are that your components are going to determine what your drivetrain is going to look like and never the opposite. So this is good as just like a base of what these are good for, but then consider what's going on in your robot. Where are those components going to be? So if you have a pit, like a like uh, something that needs to pick up balls or needs to pick up pieces and you want it to be one of those big scoop things, then you're going to need it to go pretty low to the ground. And you have to consider, especially if you have that size of restriction, you need to figure out where it's going to go on your robot. Do you need to cut a hole into your drivetrain in order to make it fit? Do you need to rethink about how you're going to do it? Would making it X make it possible to have it resting on two of the outside um to the outside limits and then resting in the middle of it so that the weight is well distributed, but you still have that open space in that lower triangle to be able to put it on. Uh, the next thing is your drivetrain has to correspond with the wheels that you chose. So when you're thinking about the wheels that you're using, it depends what kind of drive you're going to be doing. If you've only got three wheels, I don't really necessarily recommend doing a square frame unless you're putting one of them really in the middle at the front, but you're going to be off balance on those corners. So depending on how many wheels you have available, what kind you're going to be using. If you're using Mechanum, uh, I really don't recommend using a super long frame. It tends to steer a little bit weirdly the longer your frame is. So the more square it is, the better it usually runs. And uh, lastly, if you are, you have to make sure that uh, the drivetrain is made for putting the motors on. So that's the thing that I find a lot of us forget to do is that we forget how we're going to put our motors onto it. So we make these really thin, thin, thin drivetrains. And then we're trying to put the motors on. We're like, hmm, that's not going to hold or that's a little bit sketch. So make, make sure, sure especially... Work. Yeah, make sure your motors work before you put them on. That's a big one. But <laughs> don't need to be taking them off 10 times. But uh, yeah, test your motors first. And when you're putting them on, just make sure that they're going to be structurally sound, that they're not just resting on like a one inch piece of metal and that they're wobbling everywhere, especially if there's a weight distribution to it. So careful of your motors. Um, this is kind of just examples of what I was saying about the weight bearing consideration. So if we look at the top two images, if you can see there's like a very slight difference and it's not the number of wheels, it's really just having that bar in the middle that's helping you to solidify your frame. It's giving it just that extra point where the two are linked together lengthwise, especially because it's a slightly longer body, it's not completely square. So adding just an extra bracket or an extra stabilizing point in the middle can make it really, really a lot more solid. Uh, the one on the bottom, I know it's kind of hard to see, but uh, essentially it's the idea of having something that's doubled versus just single. So the problem with having a very flat base that's just sort of like a sheet metal and then having your motors connected to it. Um, if you put too much weight in the middle, sheet metal tends to bend under pressure. And so then your wheels are just kind of going to lift up on one end or the other. And it's just going to bring your whole thing down, especially if you could try to consider that 
there are things that are going to need to pass under, then it's going to sink your entire robot and your motors are going to be working a lot harder. Whereas having that elevated base on specific points, it's going to give you that little uh, advantage of being able to take impact, having a little bit better weight distribution. So instead of all the weight going in the middle, it automatically disperses to the sides so that it's all going to on the pressure points of your wheels where you kind of want it to be in a sense. And it really smooths it out. Um, when you're making your drivetrains, get creative. So I used an example from a robot that actually surprisingly and shockingly won construction. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, the drivetrain that was made here, we got very creative with it. And uh, basically, it was indestructible. We had a hard time taking it apart afterwards. It really just wanted to stay in there. None of the components got in the way. We kept everything on the outside. So the really, we had two casings for the wheels and we used the tank system on this one paired with Omni wheels. So, or no, it was Mechanum wheels. So it was a tank and Mechanum. So we had all different kinds of drive. We could get up over things and we could move side to side diagonal every direction. Um, so yeah, just consider like the way you're going to be positioning your wheels. Everything was on the inside. I don't know if you can see those two, uh, the two frames, but all of our wheels were on the inside of the two parallel frames and they were linked with bars in the middle afterwards on both levels. So we had that impact resistance. We had the ability to keep our wheels safe and not hitting anything. And everything was all cleared so that all of our components in the middle were not being obstructed by our drivetrain. And also not to mention that the... Having the two sides like this, it allowed you to have an axle with a bearing on each end that was floating in a sense and supported instead of having the wheels directly mounted to the motors. So any impacts were transferred to the frame instead of to the motor and the motor mounts, which made it a lot more durable. Yeah, good point. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about certain external factors. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but there might be ramps this year. And by might, I mean, you should definitely know that if you're at kickoff. So when we're thinking about ramps, it's not just elevated ground. We have to think about three specific things. So the first one is gravity. For those of you that don't know, that's what keeps us on Earth. Um, <laughs> sorry. But uh, yeah, so gravity does play a very important role. If ever your robot is taller than it is large, it runs the risk of raising its point, its center of gravity. So anyone who studied physics knows these little diagrams that we have uh, up on the top left corner. Thank you, Patrick. And in the middle where your center of distribution is, the higher it is, the more it's going to be pulling backwards and down when your robot starts to come in at angle. So if all of a sudden your center of gravity is behind where your wheels are, you're in big trouble because that thing is going to fall over. So you always want to make sure that your center of gravity is kept between your wheels so that it's pushing between your two wheels and it won't fall backwards when you're going up the ramp. And uh, the best way to make sure that you don't fall because of gravity is either to make a smaller robot or to have some way of keeping the center of gravity in the front. So for example, I had a robot one year that had a really big long arm. And uh, when we brought up the big uh, launch system, if it was up while we were going down the ramp, then we would automatically fall over and our robot did not stand a chance. So we had to angle it down and turn our robot around so that all of the weight went towards the top of the ramp. And that way it was nicely guided down instead of falling backwards if we turned it the other way. Yeah, so the second, where your, your track width as well and your track width and your length can come into play as well. You can play with it like that. Yeah, so you have a better balance, like center. You're, you're better dispersed. Um, the second thing that you want to think about is your angle of approach. So the angle of approach is the part in front of your robot when you're going to the beginning of the ramp. So the departure angle is uh, when you're trying to access the bottom of the ramp. If the front of your robot is hitting the ramp before your wheel is, then there's no way for you to keep going forward because you're just going to be hitting the ramp and your wheel cannot get up. So you want to make sure that the wheel is hitting the ramp before the front of your robot does. That way it can lift up your robot and then it has that clearance. Um, the best way to do that is to either bring your wheels closer to the front. That way there's less distance between the front of your robot and the wheel so that when it's moving forward, it doesn't have to, it can go a lot closer before it hits or to raise your robot. So the higher your robot is, if you see the angle, the higher up you are, the further onto the ramp that you can get before you hit it. 
because the ramp is always going up. So the higher your robot is, the more clearance you're going to have. So those are the two main strategies is bring your wheel forward or bring your frame up. And that way you're always going to have clearance. And you can even measure those things just based on the angle, see how much of an angle you can fit between the bot, like the first part of your wheel and the front of your robot. And the last thing is the angle de rupture. So that's kind of the opposite, where at the end, you're going to be going uh, like the breakover angle. So that's more for the bottom of your robot. It's when you're going to the top of the ramp. As your front wheel is coming on, your robot is starting to level. But you want to make sure that as it's leveling, it's not scratching the entire undercarriage of the robot or taking off any of your components. So you need to either make sure that your robot is high enough or that your wheels are close together enough that they're going to make sure that it's a steady ride over that little uh, end of the angle. Pat, do you have another way to make it clear? Well, just one point that I would like to make is that you, you can improve your approach angle and your breakover angles by lowering the wheels or putting them further out. But when doing that, also consider how, how you're going to be lowering it. So if you just kind of put an extension and put a tiny wheel on the end of a stick, and that's your, your lift for your robot, that puts a lot of, that, that puts a lot of force and a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, it basically makes that that part that you're bringing down on your robot, that extension, is going to have a lot of leverage on the mounting points. So what I would argue is probably the easiest way to do it could be putting larger wheels, having a larger diameter of wheel, because that will lift everything up. And realistically, usually anyway, there isn't much lower than the center point of the wheel underneath your axle, the motor will stick down a little bit. But for the most part, if you're missing a little bit, maybe going from a four inch diameter wheel to a six inch diameter wheel will give you that extra inch of lift. But uh, besides that, uh, I think you got it pretty well. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is having multi-level frames can also help to if you don't have the option of a bigger wheel so that like Patrick said you're not just adding a stick make a frame with several levels that you can just sort of bring it down just that little extra bit. Um, next up we've got the stairs factor. So we don't necessarily have stairs this year, but we felt we would just touch on it very, very briefly. If ever you do have stairs, there's many different ways that you can go over it. These are the big ones that I've seen used a lot. So the first one is just using a tank. This works really well when the stairs are longer than they are steep. Um, if it's too steep, then yeah, you're going to run that risk of as you're starting to go up, your whole robot is just going to fall right back. So when they're very long, you can use that sort of triangle tank system with that front uh, elevated wheel to just sort of bring you up and it's just continuously pushing up on the stairs and your back wheel is pushing everything forward as the front ones are just pushing up to level you out. The next one is uh, La Stratégie des Roues Ambulantes. So the one in the middle on the top, it's a wheel of wheels. So you're basically, every time you're moving forward, one of the wheels is coming over and it's just continuously like windmilling itself up the stairs. And then right on the right side, there's also the one that's kind of similar to the Roux Ambulante, but it's using legs. So kind of like I was explaining earlier, you can either have them swivel like a dog so that they're always just moving you know, in either direction, or you can have them be unidirectional and just sort of continuously pushing themselves up and moving forward. Um, there's the strategy of, uh, it's kind of like a, a worm or uh, like a leech. So basically it's just sort of slithering itself and then bringing itself up and then pushing up so that it can bring itself. It's like dragging itself like a zombie almost. Then we've got the uh, forklift strategy. So the front wheels can actually lift up entirely from the robot, clear the step you're going on, and then the middle wheel will lift itself up, clear the step it's going on, and then you have that good balance so the back wheel can finally lift itself up, clear the whole ramp, and then you're good to go. And you can repeat that over and over and over again as needed. And the last one is the crawling robot. So you have the front two wheels that are kind of on a swivel on their own independent from the back wheel so it can swivel up grab onto the stair and then push itself up before rolling forward with the back one so kind of similar to uh, la Panteuse, but there is that distinction in that it's a swivel concept and not just one wheel that's sort of pulling itself across so just things to keep in mind rails so 
the big three on rails is balance, guides, and pressure on wheels. Pat, do you want to elaborate on that one? Yeah, so basically balance, would, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but we'll touch on it anyway. Basically, when you're on rails, as you can see in the photo of this truck, you want to make sure that you're balanced side to side because you have a very small area of traction compared to a, just a flat floor. So if you're not balanced properly or say when you designed your robot, you put all your batteries and everything on one side and not on the other, your robot will either have a tendency to pull to the side where there's the most weight balanced or in a very worst case scenario, it can lift slightly under extreme circumstances if you're moving too quickly, for example. So that's where the balance of where your components, where your components are going to go comes into play and the weight balance that we talked about earlier. There's the guides, which as you can see in the photo of this truck, it has its normal wheels to be driving on the street. And then these wheels, these trucks usually work on railroads, like you'll see them a lot doing maintenance. These wheels on the front and the rear, the small ones, I'm not sure if you can see on your screens, but there is a lip on the inside of the wheel, which goes further down than the face that rides on top of the track. So basically, there's no way for them to be pushed off once they're down. They're hydraulically controlled and they come down. And then the pressure on the wheels. So that hydraulic control that pushes down these wheels, it pushes down enough on the wheels that it takes pressure off of the main tires of the truck. That means that these wheels with their faces that are guiding it on the rails, they basically have no choice but to stay there because they can't be lifted unless you lift the entire truck. One thing I also just want to add to that is uh, those wheels are really cool because they can fit inside of the rails. But if you ever have a situation where you cannot necessarily put something inside of the rails, you also have the option of having the opposite concept where the outside of the wheels are a little bit longer or they can kind of hug onto the rails and use that as an exterior guide, um, kind of like a linear slide. So for people who have sliding doors, kind of the same concept. You can have something hugging around a specific track. That way you can't shift from side to side and your navigation will be easier as long as you're not trying deliberately to throw yourself off of a rail. If you just have those small shifts in movement, it'll block you from being able to go any further and falling off by accident. Yeah. And this year, I strongly recommend to not try and throw yourself off of the rails because it Please is quite a, quite a big drop and you're, you will hurt your robot and that's not mm -hmm. fun. No, we don't have robot hospitals nearby. <laughs> All right, so gearbox ratios. This is something that took me a very long time to understand because I am a visual learner, and that's why I added those fun little pictures, and I hope that they help you as much as they helped me. Um, so one thing that I always want to remember when I'm thinking of a gearbox ratio, so the first thing you need to understand is there's two different kinds of gears. There's the drive and there's the driven. So the drive is the one that's actually coming from your motor. And it's kind of like your chauffeur, right? It's the thing that's giving you the juice and the driven is the one that's laying back and letting someone else do the work and it gets all of the benefit from it. So the driven, it's the person in the backseat of the taxi. That's the one getting where it needs to go. So that's the outside. So that's what you're getting out of it. So if we look at the top one, we have a very small drive, but a very big driven. So that's giving us that two to one ratio because the driven is always the first number we're looking at and the drive is the second one. That got me confused for so long because intuitively you think you start with your input and then you lead to your output, but it's the complete opposite. So the way I finally remembered it is with gearboxes, you always get what you give. So the get is your output and what you give is the motor effort. So just sort of remember that you should be good to go. And on the next one, we're going to explain kind of how to figure out what you're you're getting based on uh, your gear ratios. So I think I think it's the next slide. Yeah. yeah. All right. So to understand what they mean. So again, very confusing. Um, what does it mean for your robot, depending on what your gearbox ratio is? So when your output is a lot bigger, so that first number is bigger than the second number, you don't have a lot of speed because for every single turn that your driven is doing, so uh, for it's, or no, hold on, opposite. Every turn that your motor is doing, it's only, it's not doing that much 
for uh, for the big one, right? Because it needs to turn a lot more just to get one full turn of your big gear. So you have a lot of power behind that. It's pushing really, really, really hard. And if you want an analogy to kind of think about how that works, uh, there's the push sled. So when you think about these football players who use that thing on the grass where they're just sort of like pushing at it, if they're trying to take really big steps to go fast, it's not working. They have to give a, a bunch of tiny, tiny, tiny little steps that are just getting them a little bit, a little bit, a little bit further just so that they can push that big, heavy thing and they can't take big steps. So you can't have a huge, huge, huge input for maximum output. You need to be doing those small, tiny, tiny, tiny steps over and over and over again just to be able to push that heavy load. So this is good when your robot is heavier and you don't necessarily need the speed to go with it because it won't be as fast, but it will definitely be, be a lot stronger for the same input ratio. Um, and conversely, on the other side, when your input is larger than your output, uh, it's a very fast robot. So it's not going to have a lot of uh, power behind it, but it's going to be very, very fast. So just kind of understand, uh, you don't necessarily need to understand the mechanics behind it. There's a lot that goes into it. If you want to look at how many teeth there are, how many turns per thing it has to make, it can get confusing. So just remember that when you're looking at uh, the ratios, if your input is the big one, you're getting a very fast robot. If your input is small, you're getting a slower robot, but you're getting something that's a lot more powerful. And if we're looking at comparative ratios, so the two that I gave on the top are one is a big number, the other one is one, the other side is one's one, the other is a big number. So it doesn't always have to be, because sometimes you'll have one on both sides. So just look at it comparatively. So in the first example, uh, three to one, it's going to be a lot faster and have less power because it's a little bit closer to the example of your input being closer to your output, whereas 64 to one, your output is a lot bigger. So compared to the three to one, it's less quick, but it's a lot stronger. So really, uh, especially if you're using Banebots, all of the gearbox ratios are made in terms of the output versus an input of one. So it's always telling you your input is one and then it's giving you an output. Yeah, and for those who are probably gonna be asking themselves, okay, but how do I figure out what gear ratio I need for what I'm doing? I invite you to play around with, a little, with the motors a little bit before figuring that out. Just mount a wheel to it and just, what I used to do was mount wheels directly to the motors and just try and stop it with my hands while they were running just to get an idea of how strong they were. And if you can make your motors and your mounting system for your wheels and everything easy to access, like we mentioned earlier, it'll be great because when you get to the testing stage, you can say start with a 64 to 1, which is a very strong motor, but maybe slower, and play around and test your robot. And if you want to try, say, a 32 to 1, so twice as fast but half as strong, your robot, you can test that out and you can try on whatever playing field pieces that you've built at school. And you can see, uh, well, 32 is not enough, so we'll go to 64. Maybe you might find one in between. Or you can even, outside of the motor, using either gears and pulleys or sprockets and chains, you can do your own reduction or your own multiplication to get that ideal ratio that you're looking for. So whenever you're building your robot, uh, always keep in mind your programmer, especially if it's someone who's a little bit newer, always ask them when you're trying to build something, what can they handle? Just because it seems like it's something that other people have done, it doesn't mean that a newer programmer knows exactly what to do. So just be transparent with them at all times. Tell them what it is that you plan on doing and ask them if they know how to do it or if they can figure out how to do it. Um, if they don't have the know-how, and sometimes it's not even about having the know-how. Sometimes these programs can take a long time to write if you don't have it saved somewhere from a past uh, program, like from a past code. So sometimes if it's just taking them too long and they don't have time to do it with all the other things on their plate, then your robot's not going to navigate well, even if all of your design was flawless. Your design could have been perfect, but if your programming isn't there, it's not going to run. Um, I remember one of my robots, we were switching codes so much. We were trying to work on so many different things that my programmer forgot to load on the driving component. 
So I had a working robot. It just couldn't go anywhere. So it could shoot everything. So I could unload everything that was on it at the beginning, but then it was just stuck. So um, make sure that they have the time to double check what they're doing and that way it makes sure that you won't have to deal with that. Um, when in doubt, trial and error. So diagrams are hard to understand at times. Uh, sometimes you can't memorize it. You don't have everything on hand. If you really, really want to know if something works, just try it out. So plug it in and see. That's what my programmer used to do all the time, especially when we were um, trying to make accommodations for the weights, when we were trying to figure out if the motors were good, especially if there are mechanical flaws, because you want to try as much as possible to make your design and your construction as clean, as precise to the design that you had intended but every now and then if one of your wheels is just slightly off so it's pulling in a specific direction every now and then a programmer who really knows what they're doing and has the experience can sometimes correct it in post and uh, always test the program before putting it in the final code so I've learned this the hard way more in university than in robotics but if you don't test specific segments of code and then just sort of put it in it can make your whole thing crash and you won't know why so usually if something's working on its own, when you plug it in, it should still be working. If it's not, it's usually just a communication error between your variables. So check to make sure that the variables you have are not doubled anywhere or they're not crossing each other out and you should be good to go. But having that little segment done beforehand tells you you did something right there. Now it's just the fact that you put them together that it doesn't work. And then um, different wheel types and configurations have different programming demands. So just look, have your programmer look at the wheel uh, the wheel diagrams and see if, okay, I understand that I can make it work. Yes, let's do it. And try to give them a little bit of time just in case. Uh, don't give them the robot the day before the competition and say, okay, now program it and make sure it works. Cause that's a lot to do in a night. Give them at least a good two weeks to figure it out, especially because you might have to adjust things after they're done programming your drivetrain. And what I recommend if you have the resources available is your programmer, it's never a bad time to start them learning to program your specific robot. If you know your design is going to be roughly a square robot with a tank system, and that would be two wheels on each side that are driven by one motor each side, you can, while you're building your main robot, have one or two people on the side build a much smaller robot that doesn't need to be complicated at all just for the programmer to work on. You can even... If you have the resources, some schools, they'll have like Lego Mindstorms and stuff like that sitting around. That can be used to practice your programming and practice, okay, this is the concept I want to work on. And the other point I wanted to bring up is that it's very hard to find a drivetrain system or a robot in general that hasn't been done in some way or the other before. So you can ask your programmer if they're comfortable, like Sarah said, and if they're not comfortable, they can go on Google, they can go on Manager, they can ask around. And I guarantee that somebody knows how to make that system that you're trying to program work. And it's never a bad thing to ask questions either to your teachers or to forums online because somebody's always willing to help out. And you'll usually be surprised at how in-depth answers you can get and also the help that you can get. That's a big part of being an engineer too, just as a side note, like asking for help. There is not a single invention that was made by a single person alone without inspiration or help from the outside. So the best thing you can do is learn early to ask questions and to ask the right ones. So programming, um, we're not going to tell you the actual code that goes behind it because it depends on the language you're using, depends what system you're using, but just the general, like what you need it to do, we're going to go over. So um, you need to just know that with uh, if you have a steering wheel, it's also true for the four wheels that have the steerable front wheels, kind of like a car. You want to make sure that you've got a front and back because your steering is just being done with the side axis. And so that's a whole separate thing that you're going to need to program. So you just need to program the axis going side to side to be able to turn. And then your front back, you need to be able to have an input one for it to go forward, input zero to go back, and you're good to go. It's a very, very simple code to run. Um, it's just, of course, with uh, this type of steering, not always ideal depending on what you're trying to do. And making a steering system on a robot takes up space and it's just very complicated mechanically. So I don't necessarily recommend it unless you know what you're doing. It's usually less agile and much heavier. I've tried it quite a lot in the past. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but 
it, usually for our applications, there's better things you can do, but that doesn't mean don't do it. There's always a way around it. And obviously, you know, I don't know everything and I haven't tried everything. So your mileage may vary. The two standard wheels, um, not necessarily something that I recommend doing on a robot because you're not going to be very stable. But uh, if any of you do different kinds of competitions or robotics in the future, or even just like tinkering at home, I just added this in. So if you only have two wheels, if you want something to go forward, you want the output of each side of your motor to be equal on the left and the right. Um, if you want it to just slightly turn, then you're going to want to put you want to have uh, power on both sides in the same direction, but not with the same force. So you can, for example, put your left at 50% power and your right at 100%, and then it'll veer towards the left a little bit in a diagonal fashion. But if you want it to turn on a dime, so completely do a 90 degree to a 180 turn, then you want them to be equal and opposite. So your left is going to be going completely backwards and your right is going to be going forwards for it to turn in that clock um, counterclockwise formation. And the opposite is true. If uh, if you want to go in the opposite directions than the ones listed, you just have to flip all the directions of the motors. So going front, they're both going forwards. If you want to go backwards intuitively, all motors go backwards and the same thing on all the others. So you just flip the motor directions and it'll go in the opposite direction. six standard wheels or tank treads. So this one's a little bit uh, similar to the two wheel system. Um, you got your, your two different tracks and so your motors are going to be the same. Obviously on the same track, you cannot have more than one motor doing opposite things because it just won't move your track. So you've got two motors to worry about. Um, to move forward, they both have to be going forward. To move backward, they both have to be going backward. To move one way, you, can, you can't go diagonally. You can only turn in a very turn on a dime fashion. So you put your motors in opposite directions to turn one way and then completely opposite directions to turn the other way. That's it. Again, very simple, not too hard in post, but uh, navigation can be fun, especially in a tight space. Our fun ones, so the mechanum wheels. Um, one thing I'm gonna point out for the mechanum wheels is they, the wheels themselves have directions. So if ever you're buying mechanum wheels, do not buy four of the same wheel. It won't work. Unless it's stated there. that they can be flipped. Yeah, unless, unless they can be flipped, yes. But uh, they do have left side, right side wheels. So I don't know if you guys can see, it even says it on the diagram, the direction of those black lines, you want, all of the the uh, the individual wheels to be pointing towards the middle. So if they're pointing away outside, like diet perpendicular to the corner, then that is not a good thing because it's not going to go the direction that you want it to be going. Um, again, if you're not sure, if you ever forget, look up videos or just even simpler, test it out. If your robot's not working, that's probably why. You want your, you want your um, rollers to make an X, basically. Yeah. Yeah, your rollers should be looking at each other. They should not be looking away. Uh, to go forward, just like any other system, you want to have everything going forward, you're good to go. Same thing if you're trying to go backwards, you just flip them all, you're going backwards. If you want to go sideways, now this is the perks of our good old mechanum wheels, you want to have the wheels that are pointing in one axis, so the two opposite ones are going one way, and then the two other opposite ones are going the other way, and you're going to move sideways. If you flip them all, they're going to move the other way sideways. So one of your branches of your X going forward, one going backwards, and you're gonna move to the left. Um, if you wanna go exactly diagonally, you're only gonna have two motors be powered on. So you only need to have the two opposite motors being powered for you to go in a diagonal fashion. And if you wanna go in the other way, it's the two opposite motors that'll be powered to go in the opposite diagonal way. If you want to turn on one of your wheels, you move the adjacent one, so like in the bottom uh, bottom left corner of the screen, if you're trying to move on the back wheel, so you want everything to turn on that pivot point, you're going to move the opposite side of that wheel. So like the front, uh, front left and back left, those are going to go forward and you're going to turn automatically on that back wheel. If you want to do the same thing, but on the other side, you just flip it around. So the two motors on the right will be powered forward and then you're going to turn towards the back right, uh, the back left wheel. 
if you're trying to turn exactly on yourself, so you're pivoting on your center axis, then your left wheels are going forward, your back wheels are going, or your right wheels are going backwards. So same thing as a tank in that sense, it's just gonna pivot on itself by doing that rotation. And if you wanna pivot with the back as your center point, then you only need the front wheels to be going. So one going forward, one going backwards, and you're gonna pivot on the back point. If you wanna pivot from the front, same concept, you're gonna make sure that it's the opposite wheel. So you would make the back motors move instead. Um, I'm not sure if it's clear, but this also means that all four wheels do need a motor. Otherwise you don't have all of these ranges of motion and you cannot just link them in tank so that the front wheels are being powered by the same motor as the back wheels. So you need four. Omni wheels. Pat, I feel like you have more experience with omni wheels than I do. <laughs> yeah. So as I mentioned earlier with omni wheels, they need to basically all be on extremities compared to each other they can't all be on the in the same plane so like you can see in the photo these ones are on the corners they can also be on in the center of each axis of the robot so basically omni wheels you don't it, it's it's easy to program at the same time but it's hard to program so basically you have two wheels on each side and the one wheels on one side will be controlling forward and backwards, and the other wheels on the other side will be controlling left and right. So basically, your two sets of motors are controlled together. So left and right are controlled together, front and back are controlled together. And that means that your options are forward, backwards, and that's it for your wheels. So you wanna, when you're programming your Omni wheels, you need to program a ratio of the front and back motors versus the side motors to do your strafing or side to side movement because you can you can simply if you want to go left and right you can just have the two front and back motors go forward and backwards you can also have them go forward and backwards against each other and have it spin on its axis but if you want to have your robot be able to drive forward or backwards and be going at an angle at the same time then you can have your side motors going forward and your front and rear motors slightly pulling one way or the other. That'll give you what they call strafing movement. And you can have the four wheels all spinning in the same direction. That'll make your robot spin on a dime again. Uh, and that should cover everything. Sarah, am I missing any of them? Nope, sounds good to me. Yeah. In a while. I'm not a big I've fan of the Omni wheels. They're kind of. They were very popular about five years ago, and then they just yeah. kind of got replaced by mechanism wheels because those ones the are the mechanic mechanic ones. Ones. Yeah. All right, so putting it all together, um, basically you have to consider two main big bullet points. So what are your driving goals for this year's game? You need to have the balance of speed, navigation, and force that you're looking for. So think about what's the most important goal for you. Is it speed, navigation, force? What's your second priority? And then last one is really just cherry on top if you can have it with all of your other goals in mind. So those are going to lead into the questions of which wheels and which motors are you going to use. So wheels in terms of how much do you need for navigation, what's the force that you're going to be using, what's the terrain you're going to be using. The motors is going to determine your speed and your force more than your navigation because uh, motors don't generally play into navigation unless you're going really crazy on them. Um, think about the obstacles that you have to overcome. So how is your drivetrain going to be hindered by certain obstacles that are present on the field? So we mentioned two of them. Um, how are you going to overcome those obstacles? How are you not going to fall off of them? How are you not going to ruin your robot going onto them? So whether it's when you're going across a rail, having your wheel on a specific point, just having it sink in and damaging your wheels or putting that really big pressure that if you're using something like a tire could either pop it or just really ruin, the, like it would degrade the rubber. Um, make sure that you're not doing that. Uh, how are you going to guide your, how are you going to guide on a rail? Are you going to risk falling off? Is there any chance that you have something that will block you from going too far in case your steering is just even slightly diagonal to recorrect. Um, in terms of your system, so 
make sure that you consider your systems before you start designing your drivetrain. Again, like I said, this is very, very important. If you build your drivetrain first thinking, oh, we'll just get that out of the way because my robot's going to need to drive. So we can just make it drive first and then we'll consider everything out late, like figure everything out later. Uh, you're going to be in big trouble because your systems are going to play a big role, especially if there's any systems that are low to the ground. So anything to pick up. Um, there was a year in loops where we had spools that we had to get under a certain spot. And instead of launching them, we actually had them slide down. So we needed a drivetrain that was wide enough that it can just slide. And the slide was flush with the ground. So if our robot had been a raised square, we wouldn't have been able to put that slide in place. So it's very important to consider what you're going to be doing with your components. How are you going to be playing the game? And what does your frame need to look like in order to make that happen? Um, and you also need to consider how heavy your things are going to be. If ever you have a consideration that, oh, you know what? Yeah, my components are going to be really heavy, but I need to be fast. How can you make them a little bit lighter? And Patrick and I are going to touch a little bit on that next week in terms of materials and the benefits of each one. So certain materials are heavier than others. Um, so just reconsider what you can do. But you can also think about how you can spread the weight a little bit more uniformly across your robot and the ways to reinforce your frame. So having those extra support beams, having uh, corner brackets is a really good one too, just to like push the force into each other having those cross corner brackets. So if I have that L shape, just putting a bracket in the corner, pushing the two corners together, holding them in, that really helps too to avoid them jiggling on each other. It really makes that triangle of balance. Um, so yeah, these are the big things that you're gonna need to consider when you're building a drivetrain in any year, not just this year. So think about your obstacles, think about your demands and think about the rest of your robot. Patrick, anything to add? I think that's everything for putting it together. Everything's perfect. So does anybody have any questions? We will take them. Anyone? Do you there was one person earlier who had asked if uh, we're going to be posting it on YouTube. And the, the answer to that is yes. It'll be on our channel um, sometime during the week, hopefully. So uh, if anyone missed it. Week, some, yeah, this week, next week. At some point, the recording will be posted before the competition. And probably the PowerPoint as well, in case you need it. All right, well, if uh, nobody else has any questions or little things to add, then I thank you all for coming. It's a lot more fun talking to humans than to nobody and just recording.